There are certain things that happen every now and again that make us reevaluate our lives, make us change laws and legislation. It's just a shame that it so often takes a disaster and a loss of life to bring about such change. Within the UK, recent UK history, I can think of a few of the Dunblane school shootings, the Lockerbie bombing, the Mosul lifeboat disaster, and one that I can particularly associate with, the Piper Alpha oil rig disaster of 1988. Most of my life has been spent working on drilling rigs, both large and small, mainly on the UK mainland, but also offshore, primarily off the shores of Nigeria, in the Bight of Niger. I was still working in the UK in 1988, but one of my friends, a guy I'd gone to school with, raced sidecar with, and eventually would work offshore with, was working as a coring engineer, which would eventually become my forte. We were flown out when the drilling contractors were approaching, approaching what could be hydrocarbon layers. <coughs> we would run core barrels with diamond crowns to extract rock cores that then would be assessed for the oil extracting viability. This meant that we could be called out anywhere in the world at very short notice. I knew that Bob, my friend, had been working uh, the North Sea fields off Aberdeen, so on the evening of the 6th of July 1988, when a news report came on the TV about an oil rig on fire in the North Sea, I began to get worried. To cut a long story short, I eventually found out that Bob was back on shore by this time, but before the advent of mobile phones, this was quite a worrying couple of days. The rigging question was Piper Alpha, and 167 men lost their lives. 165 on the rig and two on a vessel trying to lend aid. Only 61 people survived. It was an absolute disaster. Having worked in this environment, I feel at least a little bit qualified to speak about the disaster. Normally, I tend to think that only those involved should have an opinion. I have an opinion, but it isn't my place to voice it. I'll just deal with the facts as I understand them. Most of the physical evidence sank to the bottom of the North Sea, so the testimony of survivors and witnesses had to be woven together into a coherent story. The Cullen Enquiry uncovered not only what probably happened on the terrible night of the 6th of June 1988, but also the complex path leading up to it. The early warnings and missed opportunities that might have prevented a tragedy in which 167 people lost their lives. Late in the evening of the 6th of July 1988, a series of explosions ripped through Piper Alpha platform in the North Sea. Engulfed in fire over the next few hours, most of the oil rig topside modules collapsed into the sea. 167 men died and many more were injured and traumatised. The Piper oil field lies about 120 miles north-east of Aberdeen in Scotland. Discovered in January 1973, it was one of the first deep water reservoirs to be exploited in the North, North Sea. Production of oil started in December 1976, less than four years after discovery a record that has only rarely been beaten. Oil was exported through a subsea line 120 miles long to the purpose-built refinery on the island of Flotter in the, in the Orkneys. Piper Alpha proved spectacularly productive and when the operator, Occidental, sought permission to increase rates, permission was granted on condition that gas, a byproduct, should also be exported Instead of being flared, you'll see this on the photographs of oil rigs where they've got flames coming out of them. That's the flare in the gas off. A gas treatment plant was retrofitted and gas export started in December of 1978. Note, there's two modes of operation on one of these rigs. You've got phase one mode where excess gas is flared and phase two mode where gas is exported. Piper was operating in phase two mode until three days before the disaster when the 
molecular sieves were taken out of service for routine maintenance. The gas and condensate treatment facilities were then reconfigured so that Piper could operate in phase one mode flaring off. At about 9.45pm on the 6th of July 1988, condensate pump B tripped. Shortly afterwards, gas alarms activated, the first stage gas compressors tripped and the flare was observed to be much larger than usual. At about 10 o'clock, an explosion ripped through Piper Alpha. Witnesses heard a sustained high-pitched screeching noise followed by the flash and woof of an explosion. The men in the control room were knocked off their feet and thrown to the floor. Most men were off duty in the accommodation block. They were lifted from the chairs and thrown from the beds. Witnesses reported a second flash and a bang as a huge fireball roared up into the night sky. 20 minutes later, at about 10.20, a high-pressure gas line connected to the Tartan platform, operated by Texaco, ruptured, releasing gas at an initial rate of about 3 tonnes per second. 15 minutes later, at about 10 to 11, a total operated gas line ruptured, releasing gas flowing through Piper Alpha from the frig field. A fast rescue craft launched from standby vessel Sandhaven was destroyed by this explosion, killing two of the three-man crew and six men they'd just rescued from the sea. 80 minutes later, to about 20 past 11, the gas line to Claymore, another platform operated by Occidental, ruptured. By this time, the structure of Piper Alpha was so badly weakened by the intense fires that the top side started to collapse. The main accommodation module, a four-storey building in which at least 81 men were sheltering, slid into the sea. All those inside died. By the early morning of the 7th of July 1988, three quarters of the original top size, together with significant sections of the jacket, had been destroyed and lay in a tangled mass on the seabed, 140 metres or 460 feet below. The fires from the wells and the oil and gas lines, all of which had been ruptured one by one, had produced flames with a height of about 200 metres, 660 feet, and a peak rate of energy consumption of over 100 gigawatts. That's three times the rate of UK total energy consumption. Get your heads around that. This was a disaster of monumental proportions. It took over three weeks for the fires to be extinguished, by Red Adair, the well-known American firefighter, actually. The remains of Piper Alpha were toppled into the sea on the 28th of March, 1989, and there they will lie in perpetuity. Of the 226 people on board that night, only 61 survived. Of the deceased, 109 died from smoke inhalation, 13 by drowning, 11 of the injuries included burns. In four cases, the cause of death could not be established and 30 bodies were never recovered. It wasn't easy to establish the cause of the disaster. I mean, little physical evidence remained and no senior member of Piper Alpha's management team survived. Many possible causes were advanced, but most were extremely improbable, requiring several successive unlikely events to have occurred, for which there's no evidence at all. The inquiry concluded that most likely cause of the first explosions was the release of as little as 30 kilograms of condensate, mainly propane, over 30 seconds through an unsecured blind flange in module C where a pressure safety relief valve had been removed of uh, part of routine maintenance. The escaping condensate ignited the first explosions quickly followed by an oil pipe rupture and fire. The sequential failure of the gas line then caused a rapid escalation of the disaster.
I still remember visibly the footage on the telly and my mate popping into my mind. Like most disasters, lessons were learned, but at what cost? I went on to work with Bob on a few coring contracts on American rigs off Nigeria and never once felt any trepidation. Piper Alford happened only a few years before, but I did remember reading about groups of men sheltering under the helicopter deck, waiting for a rescue that never came. And that did give me pause for thought, as I leaned over the deck's rail, watching the tuna swim around the rig's jack-up legs. I hope you found that interesting. Just one of the recent tragedies that have just drifted into folklore. Till next time, peace and love.